episode of Teach Gen Tech. And today, Ian is teaching me about APIs because he's also from Postman. And that's about the intro you got from me uh, as Jen, your host. Ian, who are you and what are we learning about today? Hello, everybody. I'm Ian. I'm a senior developer advocate at Postman. Uh, Postman's an application that folks use to test APIs, like use APIs and, and build APIs as well. Uh, it's been around for, gosh, like a decade. We got like 20 million plus people using the software. Um, and uh, nice. yeah, I get to do fun. I get to do fun stuff like build workshops and teach people how to use Postman effectively, but also educate people on like what the heck is an API in the first place and what kinds of different APIs are there out there and, and things like that, um, just to help on the education side of it, um, just to help make everybody a little bit better at what they do. Yay. And I love that because this is a big reason, y'all, that we are doing the stream today. Because for those who don't know, uh, about two years ago, I was working for an API design spec company. Wait, API. Yeah, spec design company. That is a good way of saying it. Uh, it is. I worked for a company named Stoplight and they make it. It's pretty easy to build an API with them and I could build APIs with them which is great. And it built documentation, which is awesome. And I have on the show, we've built APIs. Great. And I am also one of the co-organizers of the Denver API meetup. It's actually where Ian and I first met. Right. And yet, if you ask me the parts of an API and what an API actually is and what it stands for and anything about the actual API itself, uh, is what I got. So I'm very excited that we are going to the basics, back to the basics, relearning it and really working towards growing our vocabulary and remembering what each of these mean. At least that's my own goal. So my hopes is other people will be able to understand that as well. And yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, I'm excited about our intro. I always get nervous about the intros. I don't know why. I'm always like, I'm going to butcher them. Every single time. It's all, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> it's your stream. You could do what you want. You you be that, you, you know? That is what I I, I try, work on doing. That is what I work on doing. But for some reason, it's like every time I'm like, that excitement. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, we're just, we're streaming. It's no big deal. But it happens every time after, I think I have like 80 streams now. So nice. <laughs> for anybody, it still happens. It still happens. All right. So. Ian, what is an API? What the heck is an API? So the letters API, when we talk about like, what's the, you know, if we look at this up in like a tech dictionary, what does API actually stand for? It stands for Application Programming Interface, which is a whole bunch of like syllables. Um, what does that even mean? Like what's an application programming interface? Um, when you think of interfaces, you could think of like plugs. Uh, when you think of programming, a lot of people are like, oh, no, this has to do with code. Like, they suddenly get a little bit scared. Um, I think to, to explain as simply as possible, what is an API? I want to use a word abstraction. Have you ever heard abstraction? Like when, when it comes to programming or anything like that? Or like how to abstract an idea, abstract painting? I was like painting. Yeah. Painting comes yeah. to mind. So the, the idea of like an abstract painting is like it, it you know, kind of looks like a thing. But when we talk about abstraction, uh, the example that I like to give is when, when my kids were little, uh, we'd go up to their room and I'd be like, okay, well, let's take these clothes out of the laundry basket. Let's fold them. Let's put them away. Let's pick up your toys, put them in a bin, put the bin in the cubby on the wall. Let's pick these books up off the floor, put them back on the bookshelf. And we call that cleaning your room. And so now when I tell you, go clean your room, I expect you to fold your laundry, put it away, put the toys in the bin, put the bin in the cubby, pick up the books off the floor, put them on the bookshelf. So where I'm, I'm abstracting that instruction to my kids saying, go clean your room. And hopefully they remember, not always, but, you know, if I had like a list on the wall of like, you know, to clean your room, do the following things. That's basically what we call abstraction. Um, when, uh, when you want to use like the blender in your kitchen, there's a button on there to say, you know, blend, change the speed, blah, blah, blah. That's also kind of, uh, an interface to 
how the blender actually works. How fast is it running? Uh, you know, is it pulsing? Is it just blending at super high speed? What speed is it blending at? It's an abstraction. It's not you in there like turning the motor. You're pushing right. a button to have something else do that thing for you. And so there's there's a lot of this kind of uh, idea of abstraction all around us. When it Quick comes to question. something, yeah. Would would you say abstraction is like what to do, but not necessarily how to do it? Um, it could be. It could be. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. Normally, when normally when we talk about APIs, though, we're basically saying I want you to go do this thing. How you actually okay. do it, that's up to you. You know, we'll we'll get into a little bit of that. Um, okay. Cool. So when the when we talk about programming and APIs, there are two kinds of different APIs. So the first kind of API when we get into coding is, what is my programming language's API? So if you work okay. in Python or JavaScript or Ruby, C Sharp, you know, even Java, C++, and C, like all the lower level languages, um, we're still kind of abstracting what we want that programming language to tell the computer to do. So no matter what programming language you're 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 writing your code in, you're basically giving the computer an instruction like go print the words hello world in my terminal. That's abstracting all the way down to machine level <clears throat> of the binary ones and zeros that actually tell the CPU in your computer, like actually go do these things to send the instruction to the video card to like print this thing out on the screen that says hello world. Um, and so we we like we're not we're not down at the hardware level like turning the electricity on and off these wires for the ones and the zeros. The CPU does that. The CPU gets machine level code, which comes from the programming language level code, mm -hmm. and then these programming languages are all kind of written in one another too. So, <clears throat> for example, C plus plus is written in C and assembly. Assembly you know, goes down into the machine code of like how the CPU oh. actually works, right? But then C and C++ are used to write languages like Python and Ruby and JavaScript. Um, and, and so we, you know, we call JavaScript and Python, for example, we call those high level languages because we're not necessarily getting into all the nitty gritty of like go allocate this chunk of memory to make an array of strings. We just say we want an array of strings and Python kind of tells the interpreter like, okay, these are the actual instructions to actually go do. And so when we talk about APIs, <clears throat> we could be talking about what is our programming language API, which is still just an abstraction of, hey, I need an array of strings that the programming language then knows, oh, I need to go allocate memory in a particular way and do a particular kind of thing in order to actually make that happen for you. So when, when we get into... Um, so that's that's the the primary uh, thing that we talk about when we're coding when we talk about APIs, but right. there's another kind of API, and that's that's where kind of Postman comes in, and that's where I've spent a lot of my career is, you know, when we talk about um, how do we get information or send information somewhere else. So, for example, okay. there are, there are a lot of APIs out there to do things like oh, go get the weather. Um, I've got an API that I can hit a button and it makes these makes these lights behind me blink. You know, that's all done over APIs. And it's still just an abstraction of go make these lights blink or go get the weather in Denver or, you know, go find a dad joke or whatever. Like there's lots of these APIs. Really out quick, there. everyone, mm -hmm. like we just need to pause for a second and just look at Ian's lights because like that is the level I want to get to someday. Like that is the goal of someday being able to get really cool lights like Ian's. He like literally since Ian's, Ian's my first, like uh, he's been on the show before quite some time ago. I think we ended up talking about Python versus JavaScript. Maybe because yeah. it was, oh, it was when I first started that. And um, so ever since that, I'm like, you know, one day I want to get my light game up and you mentioned it. So it was a perfect time to say so. All okay. Ian's fault. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I can be a bad influence when it comes to, uh, you know, visual visual uh, purchases. Um, so so even even the the idea of um, like sending and receiving information 
uh, to other computers, other mm -hmm. servers somewhere. That's still an abstraction of those instructions where I say, hey, I want to get the weather in Denver. There's still a list of software instructions somewhere, whether that's running on my computer or some other computer out on the internet somewhere, where I'm saying like, hey, go get me the weather for Denver. Something out there is following a list of instructions to go look up that information. Some other computer is actually reading sensor data and storing that somehow. All I'm doing is I'm doing an abstraction of go get the weather or mm -hmm. you know, uh, go make these lights blink or whatever. Like when I hit a button on my little thing that says go blink my lights, that's a whole list of instructions. And some of those instructions are, well, how many lights are there on the wall? Let me make a list of all of those. Mm -hmm. Let me go pick a random color for each of those, set the lights, send that packet of, of light instructions to all the panels and then repeat all of that over and over several times so it looks like this random flashing kind of pattern it's all just an abstraction where i'm not in there you know running that you know what 50 times or whatever for each of the lights that i have on the wall and doing that 50 times or however many times i want to make these lights blink and so the idea of abstraction is your you're coming up with a high level instruction to do a bunch of low level instructions mm -hmm. Oh, I like that. And then those instructions are also being interpreted as software, kind of like we, we talked about. So, you know, if, if, uh, if I'm running a, you know, a little Raspberry Pi with a temperature sensor and I say, you know, what's the temperature in my, in my workshop right now, that's still running a list of low level instructions of go read the hardware, go interpret that information into a temperature, send that temperature back to however Ian's calling it. And then Ian gets just a number of it's 68.2 degrees. It's I didn't know you could right do now. that. And that is really cool because I, when I get back uh, from this work trip next week, I should be coming back with Raspberry Pi to build it, nice. to do something. Mm -hmm. And I've never done it. So I'm very excited. And I'm probably going to, I'm going to do it live. Like, that's yeah. pretty obvious. <laughs> um, I'm excited. So that's a cool, another idea that you can do with the Raspberry Pi. Yay. Yeah. So, uh, so, so strictly speaking, the letters of API stand for Application Programming Interface. I like to think of it as like the A is kind of the abstraction of okay. programming and interaction. So, but I want to be careful, like the proper terminology for API is application programming interface. But right. I sometimes think of it as like the A is abstracting things. P, we're still programming things. But, you know, the, the word interface sometimes sounds a little weird. Um, and so we can think about like, how are we interacting with, with something? But we're, we're abstracting it in a way that's sort of high level that we can just say, hey, go clean your room. And, you know, hopefully my kid is going to follow all the instructions. Uh, where the computers are, you know, generally a lot better at following the the list of instructions that we give it. Um, and so we're going to spend most of today talking about, like, how do we access and send information to an API uh, where that's not necessarily like code that I'm running on my computer. Uh, we'll talk about, like, how, how do we send stuff over the Internet and so on. One of the what things did you say the I was? Uh, like an interaction. Interaction. Okay. Yeah. I like that. That's why I put it down here. You know, it's not yep. going to... But the, but the it's, proper... It's hidden. It's hidden. But the proper terminology <laughs> is application programming interface. I want to be... want to make sure everybody's walking away with good terminology here. It's application yes. programming interface. But I like to cool. think, me personally, I like to think of the A as abstraction just because that helps me realize like, oh, I'm taking a really high level instruction and, you know, somebody mm -hmm. else is handling the low level instructions for that. So we're going to spend most of our, our session today talking about, uh, you know, how do we communicate with these APIs? What does that actually mean? Because it's a little bit different from like writing Python and then writing the Python interpreter. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about APIs, <clears throat> there are different ways that we can send that information over the internet to actually go communicate with these servers to do different kinds of things. So yes, we'll, we'll, we'll get in and kind of break that down bit by bit. Really quick, y'all. Something that is also really good to know is that Ian used to be a uh, instructor at Turing. Turing is, Turing. Yep. that's what it was called, right? I always forget. Mm -hmm. um, still is. <laughs> you, are you still there at all doing anything or? 
I'm I'm a mentor for the for the students. Uh, I still help a lot with career development and uh, like interview preparation and things like that, like resume reviews, that sort of thing. And that's something that Ian is amazing at, and really helped me realize a huge missing part on mine, uh, which. Y'all, uh, for those who may not realize, I was job hunting for a very, 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 very long time, over a year before I got my job at Ivan. And this was, Ian caught the mistake that really helped. So I'm yeah. posting Ian's Twitter yet. Like you can, there's so much to go to. Go follow him on uh, on Twitch. He can do a shout out. I use, Is it I use the same... Yeah, I try to use the the same username, Ian Douglas seven three six. Okay. Twitch, Kick, LinkedIn, Twitter, like all those platforms, Instagram, all that kind of stuff. Um, yep. So Sundays, uh, I live stream about like career preparation, interview preparation. Tuesdays, uh, like Tuesday night, I tend to do like live coding of some kind. I'm going to be building out chatbots and and so on, uh, which use a lot of APIs. And then Thursdays, I tend to get a little more crafty. Lately, I've been getting into like airbrushing and stuff like that. Um, so I've got like some cool 3D printed dragons that I'm airbrushing. Uh, so I'll be doing that on Thursday nights. So I do, I do kind of a variety of things, but it, you know, it tends to stay around like a, a technical nature. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if you remember. Do you remember the mistake that my resume had? Um. I'm trying to remember if it was how the PDF file was generated, that it wasn't like pulling the text in properly. Um, that was I it. Remember offhand. Was it? Yeah. So basically, y'all, what happened is I generated my resume with Canva. It looked gorgeous. I exported it into a PDF. It still looked gorgeous. It was fine. But when Ian got it, he just went to like copy and paste something. And there was spacing between all of them. And like, like, and it wasn't necessarily like uh, a space between every single letter. It was like half of the word. So it would be like, if we're talking about uh, APIs, it would be app and then a space and then the L and then a space and then I-cation. And it wasn't something that was obvious just looking at it. It was something that he found copy and pasting it and something that I guess happens to a lot of people. So I, I catch it. I catch it from a lot of a lot of folks that ask for resume reviews. It's like, well, that's one of the first things that I look at is like, what made that PDF file? Um, and then we can kind of debug from there. So yes, Lex. Yes. Uh, I would say at least from this reference, I now had I had to and even when I was trying to copy and paste everything from Canva, it wouldn't go into my Google sheet very well. So I actually um, rewrote the most boring looking resume ever. But I was like, you know well, what? If it's readable, it's there. Well, the, the thing the thing with resumes is it's got to get past three things. The The first one is the automated you know, applicant tracking system, which is actually mm -hmm. what's scraping all the words and putting that in the database so that when the HR people say, we're looking for a JavaScript programmer, that your resume is going to pop up. Um, mm -hmm. The the second thing that it has to pass is the HR person has to look at it and go, okay, I can actually read this. It's organized well. And then it goes to a hiring manager, a technical manager in my case for, uh, for doing programming and so on of, you know, do they find what they're looking for quickly and easily as well? So generally the resume mm -hmm. is about like, what's the value I bring to the company? Um, but you've got to present it in a way that's going to get past the applicant tracking system as well as HR, mm -hmm. as well as the hiring manager in order to get that phone call. But that's that's so a whole other go. screen we can we <laughs> yes. can do on uh, on career prep. But that's that's the kind of stuff that I do on Sundays is help people understand yeah. like how to build resumes, what goes into a resume, how to talk about the value you bring and so on. And 3D printing on yep. Thursdays. On Thursdays. And yep. And then and Tuesdays I do coding. Yep. So later tonight, I'll be I'll be doing some live coding and, and working on some chatbot stuff. So. Yay! Um, Ian does lots of cool stuff. Yep, yeah, I I do I try I try to dabble in all the things. What I mean for me, it's like I want to go learn something and then teach it to somebody else. I get more satisfaction mm -hmm. out of the fact that I'm teaching you about APIs and now. You're gonna go do something cool with APIs than the fact that I know how to do something with an API. Mm -hmm. I get a kick out of like teaching that to other people and then watching them go succeed. That, yeah. that's what drives me. That's my intrinsic motivation. So, you know, if I can fumble around with airbrushing and somebody picks up a tip that they never thought about before, and then they go do something cool with airbrushing, it's like, sweet. You no, know, I had like yes. a tiny little piece to play in that, you know? 
Yes. Like, yes. Like the cool lights you've got behind you now. It's like I had a little part to play in like convincing. You did. Like, you <laughs> did. Like uh Ian complimented my lights when I turned them on because you know, of course I was running late. And I was like, yay, I almost forgot to tell you that you influenced my light purchase. So Hooray. that is exciting. Yes. Okay. All right, so let's so let's get into APIs. So this this is a lot of what Postman does. This is a lot of like the workshops that I do, a lot of the conference mm -hmm. talks, and going to meetups like uh, the API meetup in Denver, um, and and just helping educate people on like what are the different kinds of APIs, and then how do we communicate with those. So what I'd like okay. to do is I wanna I wanna talk about kind of the most popular type of API, but there are different kinds of APIs about. And, and these are really, how do we communicate with these other servers on the internet? At Postman, we talk a lot about how APIs kind of run the world. Mm -hmm. When you think about what's happening on your phone, like my mobile phone, for example, like every app on here is connecting over the internet to go get information. So whether I'm like looking at the weather, pulling up my calendar, checking my email, those are all making like API calls to some server somewhere to like send and retrieve data. And so there's there's this uh, the most popular type of API that we talk about is called REST. And mm -hmm. REST was actually developed back in like the 2000 era. Um, and um, to back up a little bit, a lot of how we communicate over the internet, if you ever look at the browser address bar, you'll see like HTTP or HTTPS. More, more recently, you're going to see HTTPS everywhere where the S just means it's secured. But HTTP stands for Hypertext Transport Protocol. Um, and we, we kind of have to talk about this a tiny bit before we get into REST. So Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And this is basically how do we how do we send you know these blocks of text information for like a web page, and that's HTTP. With HTTP, uh, somebody came up with the idea of okay, well, how are we going to send and receive that information to where it's not like a web page in a browser, but can I just get the computers to talk over HTTP? And so somebody mm -hmm. came up with the idea of REST, and the and and the reason is with HTTP, the way that the protocol is made. Um, and it's kind of this communication protocol. Um, it doesn't like when I when I contact a web server saying, "Hey, go get me," you know, iandouglas.com as a website. Um, mm -hmm. That server doesn't remember who I am. Like right. we use cookies and things like that to say, like, "Hey, this is who I this is who I was last time. This is who I am again." But mm -hmm. inherently within HTTP, there's no recognition, and so we call that a stateless protocol because it doesn't remember the state of who you are um and so like for uh for example if you if you wrote some code that connected to a database you authenticate to that database and then that connection stays open and as long as that connection stays open you can do all kinds of things back and forth with your database because it knows who you are but with http it's stateless because every time you connect to it you say, this is who I am, this is the information I want, it gives you that information, and then you close that connection. Well, the next time you want to talk to that server, you've got to go through this whole like magic handshake all over again of, hi, I'm Ian, This is these are my mm -hmm. credentials, can I please have this mm -hmm. information? And then it hangs up again. And so the idea of coming up with REST, REST actually stands for a representational state transfer. So the RE is repre representational, and then the S is state, and then T is transfer. And this wow. is to kind of make kind of like a stateful sort of feeling because of HTTP is stateless. OK, and you said earlier for HTTP, it's stateless what? It's a stateless protocol, which which protocol. basically means it it doesn't remember from one connection to the next who you are, because you're just coming from some IP address. It doesn't know who you are. Like there's no there's no inherent trust in the protocol itself. The protocol is pretty dumb. It's like making a phone call, and I call and I say, you know, like maybe I know your phone number, so I call and say, hi Jen, I'm Ian, I'm this developer from Postman. Um, I got a question for you. Can you give me some information? Okay, cool. And we hang up. The next time I call, so imagine like 
way, way back in the day. I don't know if you're old enough to not remember caller ID. Yes, I do. I do. Way way back in the day, the (laughs) phone would ring and you just pick up the phone because you didn't know who it was that was calling. Or as my family would say, hi, thank you for calling the Janot residence. How may I help you? Right. Yeah. That is how my parents told me to answer the phone when I was like six. Right. But that's that's but that's also kind of how these protocols work. Like the server is going to answer. And then there's this little like handshake chit chat back and forth of this is who I am. This is who I am. Here are my credentials. Okay, I accept those credentials. Like there's this whole back and forth thing uh, at a really low level. Um, And so back in the day, there was no caller ID. (laughs) You would just call and and I would have to explain all over again. Hi, Jen. I'm Ian. I'm this developer from Postman. Now, you as a human, you'd be like, oh, yeah, I remember you. You just called me a minute ago. And, right. But but the computers are dumb. HTTP is kind of dumb in that sense. It doesn't remember who you are because there's there's no there's no kind of like a caller ID kind of thing of like you're just coming in from an IP address. And so it doesn't remember who you are. So that's why we call it a stateless protocol. Um, and so then we've got to go through this whole handshake every time I connect saying, this is who I am. And, you know, you check my credentials and say, okay, you're, you're allowed to ask me, you know, uh, for certain kinds of information. I can say, cool. Uh, what's your favorite color? And you tell me that and I'll be like, all right, cool. Got that written it down. Thank you. And we hang up and then I have to call you back. But by the way, what's your favorite, you know, uh, boy band or something from the nineties. And you tell me that, and okay, cool. And we hang up and then I call you back and what's your favorite food. And you tell me that and okay, cool. And then we hang up. But every time I call you, I have to go through the whole, hi, I'm Ian. I work at Postman. We've got to do that handshake every single time um, to kind of mimic the state of, you know, this is, this is who I am and, and so on. Uh, so HTTP, is kind of a dumb protocol. It doesn't remember this state. And so the idea of rest is we wanted to kind of add a layer of state on top of HTTP where we can kind of pretend that we know what you're talking about and what it is you're trying to do. So when when we fetch a web page, for example, you've got like the domain name, like Mm google.com, but then you've got the path after that, like slash something, slash something mm-hmm. dot HTML or whatever. And the rest of that path is what we call the resource. And that resource is something that we're trying to interact with. And so th- the idea with REST is we use that path where you might have like an ID value of I want to go get, you know, user number 15 or I want to go get the weather for Denver. And, and so those components are going to be part of the overall URL that we're, that we're trying to interact with. And so the idea of REST is that we're, we're using a combination of that path as this is the resource that I want to interact with to kind of mimic a state of, hey, you know who I am. And, and, but under the hood, we still have to go through this whole handshake of, hi, I'm Ian, I work at Postman, you know, here's my credentials and, and all this kind of stuff. Really quick, something um, that is um, that, wow, words, Jen, words. I'm going to write it out because I don't know how to verbalize this. No worries, no worries. And then... Good tech. I can write my own domain name. So you were talking about how it calls this resource. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm, uh, I'm showing both of these y'all is again, if you haven't caught on, I was taught from shared hosting world. There was not as much out there in the world as there. I thought that I found out there is, and that has caused me to go, wait, you're, you're saying this, but is this the same? Um, Because, from what I understand is the forward slash blog in this example, that would be the resource. And that is, could be a folder or a file within. Within the, the server. Thing, yeah. Within the server yeah. where so, blog dot could be the same thing, or it's specifically a subdomain that could point to anything. 
Um, so the blog dot is what we call a subdomain on your okay. teachgentech.com domain name. So teachgentech.com is your domain name. The dot com is what we call a top level domain. And so we kind of break them out right to left. So dot com is the top level domain. And then it's your domain after that, which is teachgentech. And then anything be, you know to the left of that becomes a subdomain. Um, okay. That's that's I'm a whole other thing we down. can get into. That, yeah, that, it, that it won't be that won't be yeah that won't be that won't be important to to kind of go through with with the APIs. But the slash blog is the resource. But when you call just blog.teachgentech.com, um, that's still asking the server like, hey, I want to get a resource at this path. In this case, it would just be slash at the end. And so you're just saying like, hey, I need to go get the resource found at blog.teachgen.com slash. Um, and then the, it's up to the server to try to figure out, is that a resource I can even give you? Um, you know, or do I give you a 404 error? Or do I have to ask you for credentials? You know, things like that. So you when we... You just helped collect something. Sorry, I know I'm, cool. I'm going no, off. No, no worries. Uh, so so the, the resource that you're interacting with uh, on, the, on the first line, teachgentech.com slash blog, slash blog is the resource. Yes, um, so and let it, me and go so put this in my random notes area. No worries. Random so notes. It's using, so it's using, um, it's using that path as this is the resource that I want to interact with. Now, when you pull this up in a browser, <clears throat> excuse me, when you, when you put this in the address bar of your browser, the browser is saying, okay, I need to go fetch this. And so HTTP has a number of methods that it can operate on, which mm -hmm. is how it's sort of sending and receiving information. And when we connect to a server saying, go, go fetch this resource, we're saying, I want to go get this resource. And so there's an HTTP method called get. Okay. And so when, if we were to actually look at the low level, like what actually gets transferred to the server, the first word that gets transmitted is the word get. And we say, I want to get teachgentech.com slash blog. And, and so we've got these HTTP methods. And we're going to talk about five of them. There are five most common ones. There are others, but they're not going to be, they're, they're, very, they're not as uh, readily used by people who do programming. Um, there, are, there are a lot of different ones out there. But we're just going to talk about the five most common ones. And the okay. by far the most common one that we're going to interact with is just a get, where I'm saying, I want to get some information. So for the longest time since HTTP was created, get was the very first method uh, in, in the HTTP protocol of, I want to get some information from the server. OK. And so we use this for what we call fetching. Uh, of data. So get, fetch, you know, it's, it's all kind of the same thing. Like you're, you're going to gather something. So we use the word get. The, the second one that was created back in the day was post, which is basically, I want to, I want to send some information to the server. And so get is where we're fetching information. Post is where we're sending information. Um, in, in early HTTP days, um, if you had like a form that you were filling out, like on a, on a web page where you're filling in all the different fields and you click a submit button, that was being sent over a post operation. So the browser kind of behind the scenes knows how to do a post. But when you type an address, uh, like, a, like a URL in the address bar, that's mm -hmm. only ever going to do a get. And so the browsers were kind of dumb. They could only do a get and a post. Um, once we start getting into JavaScript, then JavaScript had access to some of these other methods that we're going to talk about and, and sort of what they're used for. Um, but this is where the REST and the RESTful API kind of adopted these HTTP methods saying, I want to use these methods on these resources. So now I don't need a browser to do this stuff anymore. Um, I want to use uh, a combination of the HTTP method and the path of the resource that you're trying to interact with. So in this case, slash blog, I want to get slash blog. And we could make that an API call to say, go get that information. Um, if, you, um, if you've used WordPress, like a, a very default installation of WordPress as a blog engine, uh, when you make a, a blog post, it would have like slash blog slash one and that number mm -hmm. one is like your blog article number one. Well, when you pull that up in a browser and you send that to the server, the server's like, oh, okay, I need to go fetch blog article number one. 
and mm-hmm. it returns all of the HTML and, and so on. Um, but when we call that sort of resource from an API, we're saying, hey, I just want you to go get whatever the data is there for resource number one from blog. And so REST is using that path of slash blog slash one as the state of this is the resource that I want to go interact with. And then it looks at the HTTP method for how we want to interact with that thing. Do I want to get it? Do I want to post you know, a, a slash blog? Do I want to you know, delete that blog entry? So there's all these other methods that we're going to talk about. But they will interact with the path of your URL. Uh, okay. Would this be a proper way of saying it? Is you it would find a resource uh, to interact with via the domain path? So I would change two words in here. I would change the word okay. "find" um, okay. to be. Um, we want to I- identify the resource okay. because we may, because finding implies that we're trying to get something, but we might okay. be trying to manipulate what's already there. So we, we're just we're using that path to identify the resource that we want to interact with, and then I would change the word domain to okay. be um, URI. So there's URL, which is everything: the protocol, the domain name, and the path. Okay. But when we talk about just the path of slash blog slash one, that's what we call the URI. It's a universal resource uh, identifier where URL is universal resource locator. The identifier is, uh, so just, I would just write in the, the URI. Yeah. Um, but I am going to put universal resource resource identifier. Fire instead of locator locates. That makes sense because I'm uh, okay. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you. So, yep, no problem. So the so rest is it was a very rigid set of rules. Like this is this is exactly how we're going to make this sort of rest API thing happen. It has to follow these exact rules. Well, as soon as you tell a programmer you have to follow these rules, every programmer is like, "Uh, I want a little bit of wiggle room. I want to kind of do it my way. Um, And so people Mm -hmm. are like, well, do we have to do it exactly that way? Like, can we have a little bit of flexibility here? And so around 2005, somebody actually proposed, well, let's just call this RESTful. So it's it's not strict REST. It's a RESTful. API. So it's still kind of following the theme of using these HTTP methods as well as the, the URI path to identify our resource in order to interact with that resource. Um, but we're not holding very super rigidly to this set of rules that was proposed around the 2000 era. 2005-ish. And I am writing down dates. And for everyone watching, a big reason why I'm also writing down dates is, again, I am learning things out of context and trying to understand things with other contexts I know. And part of when I worked at Stoplight, it was like learning about like open API and things like that. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but that is why I'm like, Okay, eventually I'm going to have a timeline and connect all of these things at some yep. point. Okay, so... Um, so 2005-ish, we, we wanted some flexibility, and that flexibility is where we came up with the RESTful API. So in, in modern days today, when you hear somebody talk about a REST API, they really mean they're doing it RESTful. Very, very few places are actually very rigidly holding to the original REST API specification. Um, right. Everybody's kind of doing RESTful. I used to joke at one job that uh, I used to call our API our insomnia API because it wasn't very RESTful. Um, oh, like we were, we we're trying to conform to <laughs> even even a RESTful idea of what an API was, but we were like really mangling it at the time. And so I, I joked internally that we were calling it our insomnia API. It wasn't RESTful. Um, oh, geez. 
So, so this is where the idea of RESTful came about. And because of this flexibility, it made this kind of API access between servers extremely popular. And to this day, by far, if you're interacting with an API where you're like sending or retrieving data over the internet, chances are really, mm -hmm. really good. It's going to be a RESTful API. Cool. Cool. Okay. So I want to recap really quick because I feel like I'm getting it, but mm. at the same time, I'm like, wait a minute, what? So when we were talking about REST APIs, they were only using HTTP protocol or HTTP protocol is saying protocol twice, like ATM machine. Right. Yeah. But for some reason, I it makes sense saying that it's a protocol. So um, because it was like, hey, if we just do it based off this regular protocol, um, it's stateless, meaning that it's never going to remember anything. We have to reauthenticate every time. It's going to take forever in a day, and there's not enough. It's going to take forever, so we're not going to do it. Right. So then they were like, yo, let's make representational state transfer. And so it's still, is it still using... H it still uses HTTP, mm -hmm. but instead right. of it having to re-authenticate every time, it is identifying the resource it wants to interact with. No, it still has it still has to do that handshake every time it connects. Okay. But the idea the idea of state is is really um, uh, like what what is it that we're trying to manipulate? So when we think of like I want to I want Python or JavaScript or whatever to uh, to manipulate or, or connect to a database and interact with that database. You authenticate one time and you just have, mm -hmm. you've, you've got that open pipe to the database and you can just manipulate whatever you want as long as you're allowed to. With the idea of HTTP is that you, um, um, because by its very nature, it makes a connection. You send, like I send a request, you send me a response and then we hang up. The next time I connect, we've got to, you know, you've got to make sure that I'm still allowed because I'm just showing up from some IP address. You don't necessarily know who I am. Right. And this is why this is why we came up with things like cookies and stuff like that. So even on right. a web page, for example, when you say I want to go get this web page, when you make that request, it's actually sending all of the cookies for that site to the server saying, by the way, these are all the cookies that you told me to save last time that may indicate to you who I am. And so that's why when you log in at say Amazon to do some shopping and then you close your browser and tomorrow you go back to Amazon, Amazon still remembers who you are. The dumb HTTP protocol just says like, hi, I need the homepage for Amazon. By the way, here's all my cookies. Amazon looks at those cookies and goes, oh, it's Jen. Jen's back to do more shopping for more cool lights. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and it sort of, it kind of remembers who you are. Bad. It doesn't remember. It's because we're sending that information to say this is who I am. And so there's still an authentication. But the idea with REST is that you're, you're identify like REST is using the HTTP method plus the path in order to mimic a state of this is the resource that I want to uh, interact with and this is how I want to interact with it. So the, the, the HTTP methods are how we want uh, to interact with the resource which are that these. we're trying to yeah. So I, get it, get them post. Yeah. And I we're going to talk like about three more. Yeah. I feel like it's starting to make sense, but at the same time, I'm like, something is still missing, but that is okay. This is, I've learned, it's taken me a while to learn that it doesn't need to click right away. It clicks mm -hmm. enough so I can continue, but it's okay if it doesn't like quite stick yet. Yeah. You it's know, okay. we'll, we're we'll going to go from stateless to rest, you know, intellectually. Yep. And learning. Uh, okay. Anyway. So, so HTTP <laughs> is always stateless, no matter what. REST okay. is kind of like the next layer up where we're trying to mimic some idea of state and what it is we're trying to interact with okay. um, by using that path as well as the HTTP method uh, to kind of combine those two things as far as like, this is how I want to interact with this resource. Um, and then RESTful is basically, you know, we wanted some flexibility there where it wasn't this rigid set of rules that we had to follow very explicitly. We wanted a little bit of flexibility on, you know, does it have to be slash blog slash one? Could it be slash blog slash hello world? 
Um, you know, can we still go oh. find that as our identifier? Like, does it have to be a rigid integer identifier? Does the path have to, you know, et cetera. And so the idea of REST was a very rigid set of rules where RESTful, we as programmers kind of rebelled a little bit and we're like, no, nah, dude, we want some flexibility here. And that's where we came up with RESTful. So we don't have to follow those rules exactly, but we still kind of stay with the theme of we're going to use those HTTP methods to interact with a resource. But we've got a little more flexibility as far as like how we do that and the status codes that come back that indicate whether it was successful or not and, and so on and so on. Would you say being able to use a string then? So that way it's like blog slash Ian? Yep. And so so nowadays when you set up WordPress, it'll typically uh, come up with like a URL friendly version of whatever title of your blog post is. So you don't see slash blog slash one. It'll yeah. be like slash blog slash welcome dash to dash my dash blog exclamation point or something. And, and when you when you tell the server, hey, I want this resource, it looks at that mm -hmm. title and it tries to figure out, okay, which one does this actually match in the database? And then it goes and retrieves that for you. Uh, we're just going to say teach Gen Tech API. So it'd be teach Gen Tech API as my example sure. today. Yay. That's good. All right. Okay, cool. Thank you. So that was that was where we kind of came up with the idea of RESTful is we just wanted a little more flexibility on how we how we use these HTTP methods and paths to do a thing. Um, but we still like even even in 2023, we still just talk about them as REST APIs. But if you hear mm -hmm. RESTful, they we basically mean the same thing. Very, very few places are actually very rigidly holding on to REST and saying, no, this is a proper REST API. Those, those, you know, those kinds of companies are very pedantic about it and, and so on. But very few companies are actually very strictly conforming to REST. Pretty much everybody that does a REST API is really doing a RESTful API where it's, That's it's, good following, to know. it's following the theme of it. But, you know, every, but it's good to know, but it's also bad. Because that means every company has a slightly different way of building a REST API. And so oh. how, how you might interact with one REST API, REST API, which is REST full API, is going to be slightly different as far as how do we authenticate? How do we, like, mm -hmm. what's the path of that resource? Because every company is going to be a little bit different in how they implement it. It can add to a little bit of confusion to people who are trying to build or, or rather consume APIs in the first place as an end user of, hey, I want to go get the weather. Well, is it slash, mm -hmm. you know, weather slash Denver? Or is it slash weather mm -hmm. slash 642? Because that's the city code for Denver. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, <laughs> because it's not strictly rest, you know. And so right. every company wants to do it slightly differently. It may not even be slash weather. Uh, you know, it could be, you know, several path levels deep or whatever to, uh, to basically interact with that API. <clears throat> and so... Got it. It's it's good and bad. It's good for the for the company and for the programmers at the company because they have flexibility in getting to do what they want to do. It's bad for the end users because now every REST API looks and feels a little bit different. And they're, you know, it's all kind of okay, I've got the, you know, I've got a method and I've got a path. But aside from that, like how I actually interact and authenticate and you know, what kind of protocol am I using? Like it made it very, very different. Um the other, the other downside is with REST APIs, uh, the server doesn't, sometimes it doesn't have a lot of control over uh, what, the, what the end user is trying to do. Uh, so for example, if I said, hey, server, I want to send you some information. Like I want to do a post operation on this resource. And the server comes back and says, okay, I got you, fam, what you got? send me whatever data you want to send. And I start sending like terabytes of data. The server has no way of saying like, hold up, hold up, hold up. That's way too much data. You can't send me that much data. It has to wait until the whole thing finishes before the server can respond and say, nope, I can't handle all that data that you sent me. Sorry, you just spent all that time transferring all that data and I can't even handle it. 
So, okay, you say that. And again, for anyone joining us for the first time today, I, uh, Ian is from Postman and understands APIs very, very well. And I have been, had Teach Gen Tech streaming for almost a year now. And I am definitely piecing things together. And as you're saying, uh, with the pulling information off the server, no matter how large it is. And I started working at Ivan, which is a data infrastructure company about two months ago. And we, part of my new role is learning about Postgres and which is a database. It's a relational database, which I don't quite know what that means, but I will someday. Anyway, when they do a query on a database, is that technically using an API because it doesn't, since it's just going to pull no matter how large of an amount, or is it only an API if a web, like something else is pulling the querying it from the outside? Great. great question. So at the very beginning of the session, we talked about uh, the idea of abstraction. So when you're interacting with a, with a database, you're still abstracting the instructions of storing and retrieving data. So technically, that is using some kind of API. You've got some sort of language and protocol of this is how we're going to send and receive information from one another. So that's still, that's still using a type of API. It's not the same kind of like RESTful API. Like you don't connect mm -hmm. to a database with a GET or a POST. You're, it's it's going to have its own communication protocol that's not HTTP. Um, Interesting. It's starting to click um, really quick, just to, I, I am putting this down here in my like other notes for REST API downfalls of all companies do it different. And you said that it's with security and what else? Um, for things like authentication and uh, um, authentication. Thank you. And like how they, how they basically build the API. Like everybody builds their APIs slightly differently. Some people, um, you know, do you have like query parameters? That's where you have like the question mark on the URL and oh, the yeah. hands, you know, where you've got the parameters there. Some people want those things in headers where you're sending the headers instead of parameters. Some want both. Um, you know, how do you send that API key? Is it a query parameter? Is it a header? Um, how do you indicate what kind of content you want to get back? Do you want to get it in JSON format? Do you want it in XML format? Do you want plain text format? Like, can you even tell the server how you're going to get that data back? Or does the server, is the server rigid that it can only give you back one kind of data? So if you, if you connect to a server and say, give me the weather information in XML format, and it says, sorry, I can only do JSON, you know, now you've got kind of this miscommunication. So every company is doing things slightly differently, which ends up confusing people who are new to interacting with APIs. And then you said that the other uh, REST API is when you do call something, there's no way of stopping the data limit because it's just going to load everything that you ask. Yeah, so, for. so, for, so a, a good analogy would be like, hey, Jen, you know, I call you on the phone and be like, hey, Jen, can I read you a story real quick? Can I, can I read you a story? Sure. All right. Um, well, Prince, Genoa, and Luca are now nothing more than appendages of the Bonaparte family. I warn you that if you don't tell me we're going to have war, if you still allow yourself to condone all the infamies, all the atrocities of this Antichrist, on my word, I believe he is an Antichrist, I will not recognize it's war and peace, right? You're not going to sit and like wait for me to read the entire story of war and peace. You'd be like, hey, man, like it's lunchtime. I got to go. The server has no way of interrupting a client when the client says, hey, can I send you some data? The server's like, yeah, okay, go ahead and send it. It has to wait for the client to send all of that data to go, dude, you just made me sit through war and peace. Like, I thought you were going to read like a poem that your kid wrote. Like, um, and so the server has no way of interrupting uh, with, with a typical REST API. It has to wait for the, server, for the client to send everything to the server for the server then to say like, hey, all that time and effort you just spent sending me all that data, I, I just dropped it on the floor. I can't deal with all of that. Um, cool. I can't even, right? It, it's got no way of like stopping that interaction, you know, in, in right. the process. So it's, these, these are kinds of drawbacks that servers have. And it's, it's, you know, partly from HTTP and it's partly from, you know, just how we, how we build software. But um, so there, there are, there are benefits and, and uh, disadvantages to all these different kinds of APIs that we're going to talk about today. So, like I said, the most popular kind of API is a RESTful API, 
which is typically I call, like I, I call Jen and I say, Hey Jen, I got one question for you. What's your favorite food? And you tell me your favorite food is pizza. Cool. Thanks. And I hang up the phone and the next time, Hey Jen, uh, what's your favorite topping to put on a pizza? Cheese. Okay, cool. And then I hang up the phone and then I call, hi, Jen, I'm Ian, a postman. We go through this whole authentication. What kind of cheese do you like to put on your pizza? I don't know. I just like gluten-free cheese pizza. Okay. That's not the so, response you were looking un- for, though. <laughs> unknown. All right, cool. And I hang up and I call back again. You know, hi, I'm Ian from Postman. Jen, what's gluten-free mean you know and then Uh, you know you you have that i mean that's a whole other conversation and we have (laughs) so the the idea with a rest api is it's a single transaction i make a request you send me a response and then we say bye-bye and the next time we got to jump through all those authentication hoops every single time and so with a restful api you connect to the server you make a single request you get a single response and then you hang up so when we talk about like, how do we load a web page? So you imagine you go to something like, uh, uh, like a Pinterest page and you say, okay, I want to go get Pinterest.com. Well, what the server sends you back is just the HTML of the page. It doesn't send you anything but the HTML. What mm-hmm. your browser has to do then is interpret everything in that HTML to say, okay, well, there's this CSS you know, style sheet I have to go fetch. There's some JavaScript I have to go fetch. I've got all of these images of all the coolest crafts and whatever the people are putting on Pinterest. It has to go back to the server every single time. Hi, I'm Ian from Postman. Can I please have this image? Cool, thank you. Click. Call back again. Hi, I'm Ian from Postman. Can I have this image? Cool, thanks. Click. That would take forever. Hi, I'm Ian from Postman. Can I please have, you know, this or that? Well, the browsers are pretty good at setting multiple requests at a time. But each okay. one of those is an individual request going, hi, I'm Ian. Can I please have this resource? Because REST is a single transaction of I want a single, here's my single request. I want a single response. And then we hang up. So it's, it's inefficient if you want multiple pieces of information. And so most REST APIs when they work on HTTP, they're using HTTP version one or version 1.1 is more common. And version one is the single transaction of single request, single response. Request, single response, okay. And that makes sense. Yep. So that was all fine and good. And for most APIs, that's all we need. Like, hey, go get me the weather in Denver. Go fetch my latest list of new emails. Go get my, you know, the newest things on my Twitter timeline. Go get, you know, whatever. We're making a single request. We get a single response of data. And then our software interacts with that. But if we, for a single request and a single response, can that request have like how you were asking about pizza of like, hey, what's your favorite crust? What's your favorite topping? What's your favorite cheese? Those are all different requests instead of one request with sub requests. Sometimes with APIs, the developers would be like, let's just take in a whole structure of, you know, what the user actually wants. And we'll try to figure out some way of packaging all that up and sending it all back. But that's kind of moving away from the idea of REST, which is I want to interact with a single resource. So that would be like, you know, I want to uh, go register as a user and pull up my profile page and send you a profile image. Like I'm trying to do a bunch of instructions all at the same time. And that that generally kind of moves drastically away from the idea of a RESTful API where it's like I'm, I'm interacting in a single way with a single resource. Now, even in the case of like our pizza example here, I'm asking for a lot of information about pizza. So that might be where we put in query parameters. Like I want to interact with uh, gen.com slash favorite pizza. And then I start sending in query parameters of 
of favorite crust, favorite cheese, favorite topping. Query parameters corn. would be like the sub request that I'm calling it. Maybe. Yeah. Or, or just, okay. you know, while you're, while you're fulfilling my request to go get favorite pizza details, I specifically want these details or something like that. And so that's where sometimes we'll get into query parameters on, you know, instead of going and getting every pizza, uh, you know, topping out there, I want to get just, you know, send me 10 at a time and we can get into like pagination and things like that. Uh, where I could say like, just okay. give me like however many pizza deals you got, just give me five pizza deals at a time. And if I want more than five, I'll ask for the next five pizza deals kind of thing. And so that's where we get into query parameters where we can kind of filter things down a little bit. But again, it's up to the programmers for what we want to build and how we want to build that API interaction. Um, and, and does that strictly follow, uh, you know, kind of our, our best practices and industry norms um, and again, this is where it's good and bad because for the programmer, it gives us all the flexibility be, that we want, but it's bad for the end users because now that pizza API acts drastically different from some weather API where you're also trying to say, go get me the weather for the following cities. Maybe they do it completely differently. So, um, there, there are a lot of good and bad things about using a RESTful API in this sense. So yeah, there are ways that we can ask for more than, you know, one bit of information at a time, but that also kind of drifts away from uh, sort of what, what the intention was behind building an API around interacting with a single resource at a time. So I just said, uh, just like the request of what is your favorite pizza, that would be a one request. But then in the query, it could be the five most recent responses, you know, favorite crust or like favorite topping. Yeah. So, so some APIs will allow you to interact in a way that says like filter the results in some way or like, you know, go get me, uh, go get me all the authors that you have in your library, sort them alphabetically and just give me the first 10 authors or something like that. Like you can, you can sometimes interact with APIs if the API developer has actually built those kinds of controls. Is like they that, may, may not have, you know, are those type of controls and those filters, those are always after they call the information. Or request it, the information. It's part, it's part of the request. It's part of the request. Because again, when I connect to you and say, hi, Jen, I'm Ian from Postman. I would like this information. That's all I'm allowed to say. I have to then wait for your response and go, OK, cool. Thank you. And I hang up. Whether that response was actually valid or not, I had to make my request all in one shot. And so that's where you would send the path and the query parameters and the headers and cookies and things like that. You send all of that as your request. And then you wait for a response to come back. So some people could be like, um, okay, I think I get it. I'm good. It'll, it'll, <laughs> it'll probably get more clear like as, as we talk about it a, a little bit more as, as we go. Cool. Um, so this, this was all fine and good if we had a single request and we expect a single response and that's the end of it. But we started to realize as an industry, it's like, well, that's a little bit limiting what if we want to ask for multiple things? And so this mm -hmm. is partly where HTTP2 came into play, where in the new version of HTTP2, well, it's, it's not, it, I mean, it's not really that new. It's actually been out for a number of years now. But with HTTP2, we can actually make a connection to the server and say, I want the following list of resources. And then we get a response back, which encapsulates all of those responses. So I can say, I can make a single request going, give me, give me Pinterest.com's homepage. And it gives me back that HTML. Now my browser can go through and I can break out, okay, I need this CSS page, this CSS page, these 10 JavaScript script files, uh, the ads, and you know all of the images. And then it can reconnect to the server and say, here's a list of things that I want you to give me back. And now the server can send all of those things back in a single response. Um, and so that, that was one workaround instead of saying, you know, can I get a list of crusts and pizzas and whatever HTTP mm -hmm. two now will allow for, here's a bunch of things I want you to give me. And, and it comes back, but that's still a single request of, I want, I want this information and a single response of here's a package of that information. 
So HTTP2 will allow you to request multiple resources, but it's still a single request for all of those resources and a single response of all of those resources. Okay. I think that makes sense enough. And what up, B1 Mind? I'm trying to reply to people while you're talking, so no, I'm not interrupting because I'm like, I also like really want well, to learn this. <laughs> well, I'm watching. I'm watching Twitch kind of on the side as well. So if folks have questions about APIs, like feel free to drop that stuff in Twitch chat. Uh, I'm not sure what other platforms you're streaming on other than Twitch. Just Twitch now. Just Twitch? I just stream cool. on Twitch and then I upload to YouTube, which surprisingly doing that gets more YouTube views because it's mm -hmm. a video and not a stream. Um, well, it, but it hangs out longer and people can watch asynchronously. They can watch at their own pace mm -hmm. and, and so on, right? Um, um, really quick, y'all. Ian is also very, very technical. We are going through the basics right now. But if you're like, hey, I have a question that's a little higher than what we're doing right now. You know, this isn't a troubleshooting stream. I do have to say that. But <laughs> a lot of times it is something we can help out and figure out. And thank you, uh, Sahaj. Uh, for the follow. I appreciate it. And okay, so we yeah, are... So, so folks have questions, feel free to drop it in chat. We'll we'll try to address like API questions as well. Um, I've got kind of a list of things that I want to work through, but if it's part of that, then, you know, I'm happy to jump around and, and answer stuff too. Yay. Thanks, Ian. So yeah, so, so HTTP2 will allow us to request multiple resources and get uh, a response back with multiple uh, sort of resources in that single response. But HTTP2 also allowed for uh, what we call streaming requests and streaming responses. And that's where we're going to talk about a little bit different kind of API here in a minute. Okay, let me go back because something just clicked as you were saying that, that I'm like, okay, my brain's not ready to move on. When we were talking about multiple resources, it's like talking about how over here we're talking about resource. Yeah. So does that mean like instead of having to only call this resource, it could call forward slash blog, forward slash pizza, forward slash like different areas. It doesn't have to be one specific area. It's going to be a different structure of that request. But yeah, it's basically sending a single payload to the server saying, hey, Jen, I've got the following questions for you. What's your favorite number? What's your favorite food? What's your favorite sports team? What's your favorite boy band? What's your favorite pizza? give me all that information back and you're going to go grab all that information and say, here's my response. My favorite number is blah, blah, blah. My favorite food is blah, blah, blah. And you're going to give me all of that back as a single response. And then I say, cool, thanks. And then we hang up um, because that's the typical restful kind of approach is we make a single request, we get a single response, and then we close that connection. Now that single request over HTTP2 can say, I want to get a whole bunch of things. And that way, I only have to do that magic authentication handshake one time. I can request a whole bunch of things. The server can process whether I'm allowed to actually get those things and then send them back as a single response, kind of all bundled up of like, here's this collective response to all of those things that you requested. I know this is very simplified, but... Um... For my visualization, I'm going to say V1 is forward slash blogs. And that's the only place it can get content. And V2 could be blogs. And images be, and CSS and images, JavaScript. Yep. Uh, I'm going to say pizza dot TSX. Right? Like it sure. could do whatever the, what it wants to do. It could be, you know, yay dot JS. Okay, sure. cool. That gives yep. me. Yep. You got the idea there. <laughs> yes. um, <laughs> Thank you. So, so we, so we realized like, Hey, this HTTP2, like that actually opens up a whole other thing that we can do because HTTP2 also gave us some flexibility about, um, do we have to hang up? After mm -hmm. we get that response back, like, can we just hold this connection open, you know, a little longer so I can I can call you up and say, hey, Jen, what's your what's your favorite uh, phone number or your favorite uh, number? And you tell me that number and say, hey, while I got you on the phone, 
what's your favorite color? And you tell me that and say, Hey, while well, I got you on the phone, you know, and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, or we could do something where it's like, um, uh, sorry, I need to take this. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, never mind. I missed, I missed the call. Um, if they call back, I have to take, I have to take that call. Um, no worries. So there's, um, there's some flexibility in HTTP2 that says like, hey, once I get that response back from you, we don't have to hang up. Like we can stay on the phone for a little while longer. And this is where we came up with the idea of um, having things that we call like web hooks or web oh. sockets. If you've heard of web hooks and web sockets, these are using HTTP2 to basically say, hey, I want to hold this connection open for a little while so that we can kind of interact more long term. And generally what's happening over like a webhook or a web socket is I make a request to you saying, my request is I want to hold this connection open so that the server can stream back information to me about things that happen. So uh, for example, if you're on say Discord, right? You can Mm -hmm. set up a webhook for Discord saying, hey, if something happens, can you interact with my Discord on my behalf? Um, so, for example, on my Twitch chat, um, there's a way that you can interact with my Twitch chat that will actually post your Twitch comment on my Discord community over a webhook. And so I have, I have a, a Python script running on my computer that basically watches my Twitch chat. And when something particular happens, something very specific, my mm-hmm. Python script says, hey, I want to... I want to use this connection that, I've, that I'm holding open to Discord so that I can say, hey, Discord, can you put this in my Discord community? And I make a, an API call, and it shows up in my Discord community. Um, and then you know, I hold that connection open. So it was, it's kind of like I call Jen, and one time I say, hi, Jen, it's Ian from Postman. Here are my credentials. And you're like, OK, cool, we can, we can chat. And now I can say, can you go do this thing? while I got you on the phone and we hold that connection open for a long period of time. Not indefinite, not a forever kind of connection. Like, yeah. you know, internet interruptions happen. Sometimes the server will say like, hey, you can hold this connection open for like an hour or a couple of hours, but then we got to close it up because I need you to re-authenticate because your, your authentication is only good for a certain amount of time. And so after a certain amount of time, we might as well just hang up the connection because you're going to have to re-authenticate anyway. So it's really, you know, there, there can be some uh, sort of communication, protocol communication between the client and the server to determine how long that connection is going to stay open. But it's pretty much, it's going to stay open, you know, uh, for these webhooks. This allows for what we call server-side events or server-side push, where the server wants to push information to you to say, hey, this thing happened. For example, if you hang out on Twitter, um, and you know you you load up the homepage of Twitter and it starts loading your timeline or whatever. If you just stay on that page long enough, you'll notice after a little while up at the very top, it's going to be like, "Hey, there's 50 new tweets," and you can click on that and it shows all of those tweets. It's because there's a there's a web socket connection that stays open that's saying like, while you while you're browsing that timeline, I'm gonna like. Uh, the server is actually going to push that information to your client saying, by the way, there's another tweet. There's more recent tweets. There's other things that we want to push to you as an event that has happened that we want to alert you to. And so it allows for the streaming of data from the server. And so we can make a single request to the server saying like, hey, let me know if like anything happens that you want to alert me about, like notification systems Uh, Like on Facebook, for example, if you're on Facebook and you see that little notification bell, if I tag you in a post on Facebook, that thing automatically kind of blips and is like, hey, Ian tagged you in a post. That's all happening over a WebSocket or a webhook. Is that what event streaming is? Yeah. That's exciting. Uh, So, and... It's basically kind of like the server pushes information. The server is pushing information to the client, yeah. So the client, so it's still doing 
like a single request to the server saying, hey, I want to like hold this connection open for a little while. And sometimes like kind of under the hood, there's like this little like, are you still there sort of keep alive uh, ping, as we call it. There's like a keep alive or like a heartbeat of like, I'm still connected. I'm still connected. I'm still connected. Uh, that kind of goes back and forth. So the client and server know that they can still communicate, but it allows the server then to keep sending information back to you. Because uh, when, you, when you think about what happens, like when I'm on my computer here, I've got firewall software on my computer. I've got firewall software on my Wi-Fi. I've got firewall software on my router. And so right. nobody on the internet can push information directly to my computer because it can't get through three different layers of firewalls. But if my computer initiates a connection and holds that connection open, then whatever I've connected to can send information back to me. And so you kind of think about like, you know, I'm drilling a hole in, in the dam or whatever to, you know, purposely let a certain amount of mm -hmm. or a certain kind of information in. And so that's basically how web sockets work is I'm, I'm saying over the web, I want to hold this socket connection. If you, if you know about TCP is basically sockets. It's, it's okay. how it's, it's a really low well, level of, of, of how this, how the internet actually like connects and communicates, but we'll put that on my one day. <laughs> yeah. So it's using something called sockets. And that's where we get the idea of a web socket is your web page is making a socket connection to say, like, I want to hold this, this HTTP connection open um, to be able to get information back from the server. While as long as I've got that connection open, the server can push information to me. I don't have to. Uh, otherwise, what would normally happen in, a, in, in older RESTful APIs is... I would call you up and say, hey, Jen, is there anything from my notification feed you need to alert me about? And you say, no, okay, cool. And then we hang up. But then I've got to connect again like every minute and go, hey, Jen, it's Ian from Postman. Do you have any notifications for me? No, okay, cool. And we hang up. And a minute later, you know, or seconds later, that makes it for a lot of traffic for me to have to initiate that connection just to get no response and then have to close that connection. So it's a very chatty kind of way of, of what we call polling. Um, and so the idea with WebSockets is, I, hey, I'm just going to hold this connection open mm -hmm. specifically for this notification feed. So anytime there's a notification, you can just push that back to me and my software is going to say, oh, hey, something came in from the server and now we can interact with, a, with the UI to yeah. actually make that notification bell light up. Um, does this, so when we go to the Webhook and WebSocket, it's no longer part of RESTful or it it's is not like, anymore. it's not RESTful anymore. Yeah, it's it's now what we call it's now what we call an asynchronous API because things are happening Magic. asynchronously. Things are happening things are happening on the server asynchronous to what I might be interacting with on Ooh. Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, whatever. But when the server says like, hey, you get some new notification, that's getting pushed down to my, you know, mobile device or my web browser to where it can like little ping or send a notification or whatever to say, hey. Jen liked that new airbrush dragon photo that you post on Instagram or something like that. Um, yeah. And so that's, that's how these things happen. So this is all part of asynchronous APIs, which are different from restful APIs because now things can happen asynchronously because I'm not polling, polling P O L L. I'm not polling you for that information. You're able to asynchronously send me that information because we're holding that connection open. Okay, and polling, like, say that, spell that one more time. P-O-L-L, -L. not polling, P-U-L-L. -L. I'm polling, P-O-L-L. -L. Uh, because you're uh, checking or you're, okay. Yeah, so in, in the old RESTful times, I would have to make a connection, do all the authentication, magic handshake, just to say, do you have anything new from my notification feed? And you say no, and I hang up and then you know, responsible software developers would wait a few seconds and then connect again and say, how about now? And no, okay, cool. And we hang up and then I call back a few seconds later. How about now? No, okay, cool. So like, you know, let me call you up and say, hey, Jen, can you bake me some cookies? And you say, sure. Uh, and, and then I hang up and I call back and say, chocolate chip, please. And you say, sure. And we hang up. But then I call you back every 30 seconds going, are the cookies done? 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 That gets very repetitive and very chatty. Um, wouldn't it be better if we could just say like, hey, Jen, can you make me some cookies? I'd like chocolate chip. And you say, yeah, okay. I'll let you know when they're done. And I just sit on the phone and I wait. 
and then you say, Hey, cookies are finished. I'm like, sweet, send them over. And you send me those cookies. That's a, that's a better interaction. It's a lot less chatter over the internet mm -hmm. because I'm not constantly calling you to say, are the cookies done? Are the cookies done? Are the cookies done? Are the cookies done? We've kind of, we're holding this thing open to now where asynchronously you can tell me, Hey, Ian alert, the cookies are finished. And mm -hmm. now, now I get freshly baked chocolate chip cookies. Yum. Yay. Subtle, subtle, subtle hint to make me some cookies. Just kidding. Just kidding. Right. I um, was like, you were saying that. And I was like, I think I'm going to go make some oatmeal cookies when we get done now. Uh, that sounds raisin? delicious. Oatmeal raisin? Actually, no. Maybe oatmeal cranberry. Oh, Ooh, oatmeal that's cranberry. what I'm going to make. Ooh. Oatmeal cranberry. I'm probably going to make them now. Craisins? Cranberry raisins? No, they're... um no? It's regular just, cranberries? Just regular. Cr they're frozen. Right. So I got to right. defrost them, but... um. So anyway, so that's how asynchronous APIs came to be is because we wanted a way of saying, do like, there's got to be a better way than like constantly pinging the server right. or asking for, for this over and over and over again. So we come up with this idea. Now, there are downsides to that, too, because servers, the way that TCP works, they can only have 65,000-ish connections at a time. And so imagine if you're Facebook and you've got, a you know, what, a couple of billion users on your platform. Every server can only have 65,000 connections maximum. That's a lot of servers that you're going to have to spin up to allow all these connections from all these users who may be on multiple devices. I might have multiple browsers open. I might have a mobile phone and a tablet and maybe a smart TV all connecting to Facebook. So maybe me as an individual user, I've got like 30 of these WebSocket connections myself. Multiply that by billions of users. Right. And so TCP only allows for 65,000 ish connections. Um, and so we needed a way of, of, uh, so that's the downside to WebSockets is you're basically holding open one of those connections for a long period of time. Where with RESTful APIs, as soon as I get that information, I shut down that, that connection between me and the server. And now somebody else can connect to the server instead. So think of it like an actual phone line where I call you on the phone. Nobody else can call you until we hang up our phone call. Then people there's can no call, call you and have that conversation. There's, yeah, there's no, there's no idea of call waiting here. Kids these days, they don't know what know, they right? missed. They're, they're missing out on <laughs> what that little beep in the background was. Or even back in the day, we didn't even have call waiting to get that beep. You just get a mm -hmm. busy signal. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so TCP was only 65,000 connections per server, did you per say? Per server, yeah. And so I don't know, you know what we're... It... Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Uh, I was like, TCP, I should look into that one time. Yeah. So, so... the idea with <clears throat> the idea with WebSockets and webhooks then is you're holding that connection open long term. So the the benefit of REST is that as soon as that connection is or as soon as that communication is finished, you close that connection, which frees up a connection for somebody else. Where asynchronous you're holding that connection open which blocks somebody else from using that connection and like and there are that. there are advanced ways that we're like mitigating that and like rotating things around but at the end of the day there are these limitations that are happening because of asynchronous so there's like like i said there's there's advantages and disadvantages to all of these technologies <clears throat> Okay, cool. Yay. We've gone through a lot already. I'm, I'm kind of excited that I'm also still so far following along. So that's exciting. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So okay. these, these are the two, like these are the two most popular kinds of APIs. REST by far is like a huge portion of the API market. When okay. you're interacting with APIs, it's probably going to be a RESTful API. But more and more, we're seeing a lot more of these webhooks and, and web sockets and whatever using this asynchronous API pattern of, you know, let's hold that connection open a little bit longer so that you can mm -hmm. send me data or I can stream data to you. Um, and so it's holding that connection open a little bit longer so that we can stream data back and forth, um, which is a, a different different sort of mechanism than what rest was meant to be a single transaction 
So even though okay. HTTP2 is like, here's a bunch of things I want, you can send me back a bunch of things, it's still like one transaction and REST will still hang up at the end of that. With asynchronous, mm -hmm. it's the same thing. If I make that WebSocket connection, I have to authenticate, but we're going to hold that connection open for a period of time. But if that connection ever closes, I've got to re-authenticate again the next time I call because it's still using HTTP at the end of the day. So right. it, HTTP is, is stateless. It's kind of dumb. So I have to do that authentication every time, no matter what. And, you know, the people working on the HTTP protocol, they're trying to find better ways and different ways of authentication. And how do we handle these things to make that a little bit easier, make it less chatty over the Internet? Are there other sort of ways of doing this? So they're actually already working on an HTTP 3, even though HTTP 2 has only been out for a couple of years and isn't fully adopted. They're, they're already working on HTTP 3 because they realize like, hey, even with the cool stuff that we introduced in version 2, we can still do even better. And that's kind of the nice thing about tech is there's always something new to like go and learn and explore and see how things are being built and done. Yes, I will say that is like one of my favorite things is I, I will never learn, uh, run out of topics for Teach Gen Tech ever. Yeah. Cool. Ever. So I want to, I do want to back up a little bit so that we can talk yes. about uh, uh, kind of these HTTP methods because we really only talked about get and post. So get right. was fetching data, post is sending data. But there are a couple of different ways that we wanted to interact with with data. And, uh, and so this can even come into play a little bit with asynchronous API uh, calls as well for how we want to interact with the resources that we do. Because like I said, at the end of the day, these are all happening over HTTP. And so mm -hmm. we have access to these HTTP methods to interact with um, the, the resources that we're trying to access. So we have get and post, and I want to talk about right. three more. Okay. So we have delete, which okay. says I want, to, I want you to actually destroy some kind of resource. And again, you want to make sure you've got good authentication in place because you want to make sure that person's allowed to delete that blog post or they're allowed to delete that image or something like that. That's so, not scary at um, all. Not scary at all, even a little. Um, but there are, you know, there are security concerns around authentication mm -hmm. and also what we call authorization. So auth authentication is who are you? Authorization is what are you allowed to do? Um, I could do a whole thing just on auth sometime. But um, so we have authentication and authorization. And so if you ever hear somebody say auth, like just A U T H, it's like, well, which uh, like, are you talking authentication or are you talking authorization? Because they're two different things. Authentication oh. is who, who are, are you? you? Yep. Okay. Who, what can you do? Authorization or... is, is your permission, basically, is like, what are you permitted to do? And typically, you would do authentication and then authorization. So now that I know who you are, you know, what are you allowed to do? So with the delete operation, it's it's exactly what it sounds like. You're trying to delete or destroy some kind of content or resource. Mm -hmm. And so you have to make sure that you're properly authenticating like who the person is that's trying to, to delete something. Um, and so I won't, nothing, nothing more really needs to be said on that one. Um, the other two are a little bit analogous, but they are meant to be a little bit different. One is called put and another is called patch. Both of these are meant to change a resource in some varying amount. So a post is, I want to go create a brand new blog post. And when you create that blog post, it would come back and say, okay, we've created post number five. When you do a put operation, you're basically saying like, hey, remember that blog post number five? I actually want to change everything about it except for the ID value. I want to change the title. I want to change the body. I want to change like everything that you're storing about that thing. So typically a put is saying, I want to keep the ID the same, but I want to change everything else about it. Where a patch is like, I just want to change the title of the blog post. I just want to tweak part of that resource. Where a put is like, I want to keep the ID the same, but I want to change everything about that thing other than the ID. Um, so for example, um, a post operation could be, um, I want to create a work outfit. So right. certain kind of pants, certain shirt, you know, and so on. Maybe I'm going for a really corporate job. And so I've got really nice slacks and a button down shirt. Maybe I wear a tie. That's why I don't work at corporate entities because I hate wearing a tie. Okay. Um, 
And so, you know, maybe I go work that corporate job for a little while and I'm like, okay, I'm going to change my job. I'm going to go hang out on Eaton Stream and find out how to build a resume. And then I need to change everything about what I'm calling my work outfit to now I'm working at a startup so I can wear jeans and a hoodie. So I want to change everything about it, but I still want to call it work outfit. So I'm, you know, the ID of this outfit is the same, but all of the content of that outfit is different because I'm changing everything about it. Um, and so a put operation is I want to change everything, but the ID stays the same. Where with a patch, a patch is like, I want to change, um, I want to change the sweater. You know, maybe it's not quite startup, it's not quite corporate, but, you know, kind of this largish kind of company. Maybe they're not really into hoodies. So maybe I'll wear like a button down shirt, but I'm still going to wear jeans. I'm still going to wear my sneakers, but maybe I'm going to wear like a polo shirt or something instead of a hoodie. So, um, uh, put, we're still going to call it a work outfit. Yep. But, but we're changing everything about that outfit. New shirt, new pants, new shoes, new belt. Everything okay. is different. So put is changing everything but the ID. Okay. Let me... And hi, Ramon. Uh, I don't want to forget to say hi. I hope we're still co-working tomorrow, Ramon. I really enjoy those. Okay. So put is... Uh, change, change everything about the output but the but the name of the outfit. Work outfit. But... now it's important to differentiate here that when when we're when we're calling it work outfit that we're using that as the id of the resource and that it's not just part of the resource itself like when when we would talk about a blog title for example or like a blog post the title is part of the blog post you know, that gets stored in the database. But mm -hmm. um, when we're talking here, like I need to, I need to go sort all of my outfits or something. So outfit number one is my work outfit. Um, mm -hmm. And so every time I interact with outfit number one, it's always going to be my work outfit, that kind of thing. But maybe the name of it is like, you know, uh, maybe the, like the actual words work outfit is actually part of the resource itself. So I, I just want to be clear here that when we're saying, I'm going to go create an outfit. I'm calling it my work outfit. And then when I do a put on that resource, I'm changing everything about it, but I'm still referring to it as the same identifier. Um, it's just and, for, the, for the analogy of it, we're calling it a work outfit, but the actual text and, <laughs> of work outfit could be part of what we're storing in a database. Okay. And Papa Smurf. Hello. Hello. Haven't seen you for a bit. I know my streams have been inconsistent. Uh, yeah. Update all resource attributes or fields based on based ID. on the ID. So, so the put okay. is saying I want to change everything about that work outfit: the shirt, the pants, the belt, the shoes. Like everything about it is changing except for the identifier. Where okay. the patch is saying, okay, well now now that I'm in my my jeans and my you know band T-shirt and my hoodie, uh, maybe a patch is like okay, you know, company would prefer that I didn't wear you know, Marvel character t-shirts and a hoodie. So I'm going to just change my shirt, but I'm still wearing my sneakers or my flip flops. I'm still going to wear uh, my blue jeans, maybe wearing the, the beanie or the ball cap is still okay, but they want me to change my shirt. So I'm only going to change part of my outfit. And that's where we would do a patch operation. Now, some people will use put and patch interoperably. And they'll say like, oh, either one is fine. They're both changing some amount of data because nothing really would stop you from a patch to say, I want to change my pants and my belt and my shoes and my shirt and whatever I wear on my head. Nothing would stop a patch operation from actually changing everything in there. And then effectively it is a put where a put in its nature was meant to be, we really do want to change all of the attributes except the ID where the patch is like, oh, we only want to tweak some of it, but nothing would stop a patch from changing all of those attributes. Um, I put it in more gen terms yeah. of changing the lipstick color because mm -hmm. that is what's going to like actually register where if it's changing a shirt that I'm like, is it a formal shirt or is it an unformal? Like, how is that not? Yeah in the outfit reference. Yeah, so, um, so kind of the analogy I was using is like, you know, if, if my original work outfit was like corporate where I'm like wearing mm -hmm. a suit tie, where, you know, my next job, I'm, I'm still calling it work outfit, but now I'm working at a startup. So I'm gonna go to jeans and a hoodie. 
you know, and, and like a beanie or something, but then maybe I need to change it again because they don't want me to wear a, a hoodie and a beanie, but I'm still, you know, it's still okay to wear jeans and sneakers, but they want like a button down shirt instead. So that would be a patch operation where you're, you're changing part of your outfit, but not changing everything about it. I like what you said, Papa Smurf. Resource attributes. Cool. And I'm going to put it by Papa Smurf, which works out because I am using blue. It's not quite Smurf blue, but hey, we're close. Um, so this is making a lot of sense. And I love that Ramon is here, was here, because that was the first API that I built on stream. Nice. Way back in the day, we did it. If Ramon's here, uh, hopefully he'll correct me. I believe we did it on um, Express Jaya. Wait, mm -hmm. why am I suddenly is Express is Express a thing? Yep. For some reason, I haven't said Express JS in a really long Express, time. And I'm like, Express is Express is the backend framework for Node JS that actually builds out an API in JavaScript. Yeah. Okay. I'm like, why? Why did I forget that? That's a thing. Because I, yeah, I haven't used that term in a while. All right. Cool. This. So a post sends and creates well, a or post, and or. A, post, a post is meant to create a resource. So, so with a post uh, operation, with a post operation, you're not going to send an ID. It's up to the server to assign an ID. Um, it's very, very uh, atypical. It's not a typical thing for you to try to create something and give it an identifier at the same time. Um, because that identifier might already exist. And so if you, if I was connecting to an API to say, go store this blog post, I would say, here's the title, here's the content, here's other metadata about it. And then it would be up to the server to tell me, okay, that's blog post number 12. And then I can interact with blog post number 12 with a put or a patch to say, I want to update the title or I would need to fix a typo in the content or something like that. Or you know what? I want to like delete that one completely and I just delete blog 12 um where the create you're creating everything but the id and so you're creating okay. something and the id is assigned to you and then i would say on the post yeah create a content and get an id because that's that's a typical thing that would happen with an api you're going to create something and you're going to get an id back but you get an ID back with your Git or just like you no, with post? No, with a post. With a post. Okay, cool. Yeah. And I'm just going to say create content and receive ID. Yeah. I'm like, if I use the word get, I'm going to get confused. <laughs> so with a, with a get operation now, we've got, we've got two additional ways of doing a get where we can say, go get me all my blog posts or give me a, like a paginated list of my blog posts or I want to get blog post number 12. So with a get, depending on the path, you can say slash blog and that'll get all your blogs or you can say slash blog slash 12 and that'll give you just that one resource. So depending on what you're telling the server you want to get, this it's up to the server to determine and up to the API to determine, am I giving you back one thing? Am I supposed to give you back a list of things? And so along with kind of this idea of rest and what a restful API is, if you're calling a resource without an identifier, you're generally asking for a list of things to come back. So if I say go get slash blog, I'm typically going to be asking for a list of blog posts, where if I say go get slash blog slash 12, I want just that one blog post. So if I had a library and I do get slash books, I should get a list of books. But if I say get slash books slash 12, I should get just book number 12. So with REST, if you provide an ID, you're getting one thing or you're interacting with one thing. If you're, if you're interacting with a resource where it's just kind of the name of the resource and not a specific one of those resources, then you're, you're 
generally saying I want to go get all of them or I want to create a new one of them. So with a get and a post, you would call slash blogs, where a get is going to get you all the blog posts. Doing a post to slash blogs would create a new post. But if you give it an ID value, then you're saying I want to interact with that one specific ID. Uh, Papa Smurf also said in chat, some web frameworks will send patch rather than put. Um, but if they do, you probably don't need to worry about it. Yeah, I agree. So again, with, with patch, like there's nothing stopping a patch from updating all of those attributes. But a put is generally meant that you want to change all of those attributes other than the ID. Oh, goodness. Okay. What y'all are saying makes sense. It's just also at the same time, I'm just like, okay. I'm going to get there. I will get yep. there. So so let's let's wrap up with this. Let's go I'm going to I'm going to share my screen if you want to like activate yeah, my, sure. my my screen. What I'll do is I'll show you in Postman uh, cuz I work at Postman for those that that don't know me. Um, and Postman is just a way that we can kind of interact with an API. So this API is just something I've got local and it's a little to-do list application. And so I've got this endpoint called slash notes which is just my to-do list. Okay. Um, and inside the body here, I'm going to have a title with some content and whether that thing is completed or not. So this is the, the information that I'm sending. So when I do a post operation to slash notes with a RESTful API, I'm saying, I want to go create one of this kind of resource. So notes is a type of resource on my API. So I'm saying, I want to go create a note. Okay. And so, so when you do a post to a resource name. I'm not saying I want to go post to notes six because that's that's not valid because I can't create number six. It's up right. to this, it's up to the software, or the API, or whatever to assign that ID. So I'm gonna say, okay, I want to go walk my dog and I'm gonna send that over to the server. And the the response that I get back here says, okay, I gave that ID number one. Mm -hmm. and it was for user number one, and here's all the content and whatever. So the server is giving me a little bit more context about what it created on my behalf. Mm -hmm. And so it assigned an ID value back to me here. Okay. So now I can use that ID value for all of these other methods. I can patch it. I can delete it. I can fetch one of them, or I can say, go get all of my notes. So mm -hmm. when we were talking about get and, and post on slash notes, this is where I would say, I want to go get slash notes. Now I should get back a list of all of my notes. So if I send this over, we see this comes back as an array of objects here. If you understand JSON, the, the square bracket means you're getting back a list of something. And so when I say go get slash notes, it's saying, oh, you want a list of things. Even though I've only got one thing in here, it's still giving me a list of all of the notes that I have on the system right now. Um, that actually might cause us to go on to a tangent yet at the same time, uh, I feel like it's a little important. I can get what at least conceptually of like when somebody says an XML or regular text, I'm like, cool, XML, I can visualize it at least enough because you can open it in Excel. So it does do some things. Like it's a, a little easier to visualize. Right. Um, where when somebody says JSON, I'm like, or YAML. I'm like, mm -hmm. those are things. Yeah, th those are things. Those do exist. I know they do. And I know they go to APIs. Other than that, I have no idea what they are. Is this that's a whole? A good... that's, a whole that's a whole other topic. Um, oh, so, so... bananas. <laughs> I'll give you, I'll give you like the, the five, the, well, the, I'll give you like a 30 second intro. So JSON, do you know what JSON stands for? Isn't it JavaScript? Object something? notation. Yeah. Okay. And so, so this would be a way of defining an object in JavaScript. Basically saying I've got an object. That's what the curly braces are, are sort of wrapping. And inside of that, I have an attribute called data. And inside of that, like that, that attributes value is an array. That array 
is an array of JavaScript objects. And that object has an attribute called ID, user ID, title, content, and so on. And so JSON is just a way of structuring data that you can pull it into JavaScript. And actually, now you've got actual JavaScript objects. So it's, it's just a text representation of what a JavaScript object is under the hood. But we as a community, we kind of adopted that going, oh, that's actually really easy to read compared to okay. XML and compared to other you know, things that, that were a lot more verbose. JSON is, is a much more compact amount of data that we send at the expense of losing uh, identification around, well, this field can only be an integer this field can only be a string, or this field could be a string or an integer. JSON doesn't have the idea of data types. And so you can't say like, oh, this field has to be an integer where XML can define those, those kinds of things. I'm that's, literally that's whole... writing to like ask. Uh, so Josh Goldberg, who wrote um, a learning TypeScript, comes on my show mm -hmm. every other week. And I was literally writing, ask about JSON versus TypeScript. And you you just said it. JSON does not assign data types. Yep. Well, type TypeScript and JSON are two different things. So they JSON, are. They are. Yeah. But JSON is just a way of. Yeah. JSON models, is just a way of expressing yeah. an object modeled in just text that we can that we as humans can read. Um, and so now, so the the idea that we we're kind of coming to here in Postman was when we do a get or a post on just the name of the resource. When we do a post, we're saying, I want to create one of those resources. When we do a get on that resource name, we're, we're typically in a RESTful API. We're saying, I want to go get a list of all of those resources. Mm -hmm. So now that I got, I know that I've got an ID of one. Now I can go in and I can change. I can fetch that one. I can say, go get note number one. And when I send this over, it kind of looks like the last payload that we got, but this is only a single object. It's not an array of these objects because I said, I want to go get that one resource. So if we give it an ID as part of that path, what REST is saying is, I want to go get that one resource. Mm -hmm. And then it gives me back that one resource. Um, same thing, I can do a patch where I can say, okay, well, I want to change this up. Um, I can't change the ID. That's invalid. But Maybe, maybe instead of saying walk the dog, I want to change the title to say I want to feed the dog. And, you know, maybe I have completed that. And so I can change that value to true and I can send that over. Uh, can't change that. I wasn't trying to change the ID. Mm -hmm. Okay. Something broke on, on my software. But if I were to go back and fetch that one, um, it would have changed the title to like feed the dog and completed would have been true. So I've, I've got a bug in my software apparently that I'll, I'll go fix. But the patch, because we're giving the patch an ID value, it's saying, I want to go change this one resource. Now, it's not mm -hmm. a typical RESTful endpoint to say, I want to go patch all of the things. That would typically be an invalid kind of instruction because I wouldn't necessarily have access to say, go change everything in the database to go change all of the titles because you wouldn't want to change all the titles to one thing. You wouldn't want to change the completed status to all be false. You would want to go through those methodically and say, go get a list of all of those resources and then iterate over that and change the flags or change the titles appropriately. Um, and then I can go in and I can delete that one note. So it, this comes back with nothing, but the status code here of 204 basically indicates that worked, but it had nothing more to tell me about that. Um, so now if I try to go get all of my notes, it comes back as an empty list because I said, I want to go delete that one resource. So when I do a get or a post on the resource name only, I'm saying I either want to create that resource or I want to get a list of all of those resources. Mm -hmm. But if I give it an ID value, like slash one, I'm saying, go get me that one resource. Now, if I try to go fetch this, I get a 404. Well, I, again, with a software, I need to be able to tell it to send me back a 404. But typically this would come back with a 404 or saying, I don't have that resource. Or if I'm not authorized to see it, I might still give back a 404 going, I don't know what you're talking about, dude. Where if I say, oh, you're not allowed to see resource number one. It's like, oh, there is a resource number one. Let me try and hack into your system because I know that there's something there because you just told me I'm not allowed to access it. And right. so a better, a better security way of writing an API, if, if somebody tries to access something they're not authorized to, is to give them back a 404 saying, I don't know what you're talking about. That doesn't exist here. 
Mm-hmm. And then then I'm less likely to try to break in and say, well, you know, I'm sure there must be an ID of one. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there, there's security implications about how to build APIs and so on. But I wanted to kind of show like these, these are those five methods you've got to get, uh, the put and the patch, like we said, are, are kind of analogous. And then we've got the delete. But in this case, I wanted to show the difference between fetching one of something or just mm-hmm. saying fetch all of something. There is a little bit of a different flavor on this. And this is where, you know, uh, everybody that writes an API does it a little bit differently. Here's a dad joke API where I can just call this API and it's going to go fetch a single dad joke. But I'm not saying which dad joke to get. I'm just saying, go get me a dad joke. And Mm -hmm. so in this case, I'm, you know, this, this might be better where I had like, go get jokes, you know, sample, you know, where I pass in like a size of one or something like that. Like that might be a better restful path where I'm saying, this is what I want to go get as opposed to just go call the domain name because now it's up to the software to go, oh, you're hitting the domain name. You only want one joke. So mm-hmm. it's, it's not as flexible, but this would be a way of, of, you know, a different way of writing a RESTful API where I do a get operation on this endpoint and I get one joke coming back. Um, but a better RESTful path would be something like I want to go get a jokes resource and I want to get a sample of that. And that sample size is going to be like one joke, or maybe I want to get back five dad jokes or something. That would be a better way of structuring that restful path. But again, this is where as programmers, we wanted the flexibility of being able to write these APIs any way that we wanted to. But for the end user, it's like, well, but my expectation, if I call that endpoint, I should have gotten back like a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and so it can create confusion for people that are trying to actually go use APIs for like, how do I use your API? Because yours is going to be different from their API and it's going to be different from their mm-hmm. API because we don't rigidly follow RESTful practices on how these things should work. Um, so yeah, anyway, Postman will also work with asynchronous APIs. You can open up web sockets and watch data transfer back and forth and, and so on and so on. Really quick, y'all. Um, I'm going to be right back back i need to use my inhaler really quick yep no worries if anybody's got questions about apis or anything like that uh feel free to uh, to drop it um so yeah papa smurf i i've been working at postman for a little over a year i started last january and uh, i have a blast i'm on the developer relations team over there so i get to do all kinds of really fun like workshops and tech conferences and videos and and blog posts and all kinds of content around uh api education and uh, I actually met Jen at a, at a local Denver area API meetup. And uh, we got chatting. She's like, I would love to learn more about APIs. So I'm like, why don't I come on your stream and we'll, uh, we'll chat about APIs. So we, uh, we kind of coordinated a little bit on, on what we're going to talk about. And there's, there's like so much more we could get into with different kinds of APIs and, and so on. But uh, yeah, good to, good to see everybody. So at the very beginning of the session, we were talking about like how APIs kind of run the world right now. Like there's so many things that we control over APIs. Like pretty much everything on your phone uh, is going to be communicating over these kinds of APIs. Maybe not for getting dad jokes, but for like fetching the weather and things like that. Um, These all interact over APIs. Like all these lights I have in the background, those all connect with an API where I make an API call saying, go get the identifier for each one of those individual light panels and then go set all these random lights so I can hit a button and it makes them all blink and flash because, you know, software's fast to actually go interact with those APIs uh, to go make all those lights appear to blink when really it's just sending random patterns of like, turn this light on or off. And if it's on, set it to this random color and then, you know, wait half a second and do it again. Uh, and then do that like a bunch of times. And so we can, we use these APIs to interact with a lot of different things uh, in the world. Um, so like your smartwatch, your phone, those are all using APIs for things like banking, email, calendars, notification events, like all those are happening over APIs. And thank you. I will say this is a perk of, uh, you know, when you have another streamer on your show, they just can like handle themselves if you disappear for some reason. I will say I am very, very surprised that after like 80 plus streams, that is the first time I've had any asthma issues on stream. But it was because I started like choking on something, which made me cough, which made my asthma. And I was like, (laughs) I'm not going to be able. So 
Thank it's all you. good. Thank I, you. I thought I was just getting you really worked up about APIs. That's all. But yeah. Well, I am really excited <laughs> about APIs because it was something that is very difficult for people to explain. Hmm, I see. In 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 very basic terms, um, this is a lot of tech in general. Is it's difficult to explain the high level, and. I know, especially for those who are very, very technical, which I get because you're like, I, I don't know, like you just do the thing. And yeah. this is why I do really appreciate you coming on the show because it's like for myself, at least if I don't understand all the things that the theory behind it, it makes it really difficult for me to actually implement what I'm doing where yeah. other people are just like, oh, this works with this. Cool. I'm like, yeah, or or it why? tends to be like, go do this, go do this, go do this, and uh -huh. it magically works, but you don't understand the why. Like, how does that mm -hmm. actually work? And so that's why I wanted to kind of go into like HTTP and talk about these different kinds of protocols. Like uh, B1 Mind said, you know, coming back to modern web, I thought all APIs were REST APIs. I mean, most of them are. Like most of the APIs that you interact with are going to be RESTful APIs, but we're seeing a bigger shift into the asynchronous APIs where we're getting into mm -hmm. web hooks and web sockets because we can have more of that interactive kind of thing where there's less chatter over the internet of constantly like, hey, Jen, are those cookies done yet? Are they done yet? Are they done yet? How about now? You know, I'm still waiting for those cookies. Like I don't have to pull the server over and over and over again, waiting for a response that says, you know, some task that I gave it is finished. Um, and so we're starting to see a lot more asynchronous APIs happening. And, and they've actually been supported for a number of years in browsers to actually connect over HTTP2 for WebSocket connections. That's actually been around for a while. We can build REST APIs on HTTP2, but it's less common. REST is still kind of in the 1.1 version of HTTP, where it's like single request, single response. Um, because that was kind of the nature of REST. It was meant to be, hey, I want to interact in a single way with a single response or a single request. And I get a single response telling me whether it worked or not. And that's all I need. So I don't know if REST is ever actually going to move to HTTP2. There aren't any real strong advantages to moving REST to HTTP2. I mean, there, there are some things about the protocol that would make it a little bit faster. But um, but there's, there's not like a big, like, oh, yeah, if we move to HTTP2, REST is going to be like a gazillion times better. Um, because it would mean changing a lot about what REST is, and it would actually shift more into what we're already doing with the asynchronous APIs. So I have a feeling that REST APIs are going to kind of linger on it, like older versions of HTTP for a while, where all the asynchronous stuff and the more performant types of APIs uh, are, are getting into HTTP2 and you know starting development on HTTP3. So, uh, But yeah, going back to like what we talked about at the very beginning of the stream, gosh, it's, it has been two hours. Was, yeah, I was uh, like, I'm, know, the, I'm writing notes to bug you about later. Yeah, no worries. It is the whole idea of abstraction. Like we use APIs to abstract like, hey, I need to go do a thing. I need to go perform some kind of operation. It's not like I know all the different steps to go store that blog post in the database. So I just need to go mm -hmm. tell a server like, hey, here's some details about a blog post. Can you store that, please? Um, and the server is like, yeah, I got you, fam. Like, no problem. We got that handled. And it's a kind of the same thing when we write code in JavaScript or Python. We're just saying like, hey, I need an array of strings. We're not in there manually manipulating the memory and like telling the CPU mm -hmm. how to talk to the RAM. Like it's all abstraction at the end of the day, whether we're talking to an API, you know, like a like a weather API or a dad joke API or whether we're using our programming languages API. It's all an abstraction for I want to go do a thing. And something else knows kind of the underlying instructions of how to actually make that happen and then return back a success or a failure. Oh, my goodness. Me and my coughing. Um, I will say, like, just future things I'm curious about, of course, is like digging in deeper to this and something that I know that I'll be working on. And a big reason, y'all, that I timing just happened to be really great of I since I've been learning Postgres is I'm going to need to set it up on my website. And that's going to involve working with something like Prisma, which will then need an API to be able to do all of that. So this is great timing, as well as really starting to understand where 
we use APIs is something that I'm very, very grateful for because I like, I know that they connect everything, but actually being able to see them in action is something new to me in the future. And this is something that I completely forgot about until you were at the very end. Soap versus rest. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I'll, that's what I hear a lot about, which is interesting because it's, you also said asynchronous, which cool. Um, Event streaming, because that seems to be all the rage. And I'm like, okay, cool. Which event streaming is just asynchronous, right? Uh, uh, It tends to be, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, JSON and XML in more detail. And TCP, which none of the, at any or all of these might be a you questions or just in general, I need to find somebody to talk to me about them. Those are so, so I can, I can cover soap in, in 30 seconds or less. Um, oh, yay. So soap actually stands for simple object access protocol. So you're still interacting with a single resource. So you're saying, I want to go manipulate a simple object. So uh, you're, you're interacting with an object, but they wanted to call it like, you know, we're going to call it the simple protocol. Um, and so it's a simple object access protocol. And when it was created, um, it, it, it was pretty much primarily only using XML. XML looks a lot like HTML. It's still a markup language where XML is a very verbose structure of the data uh, where you're defining fields and what data types they can have. And if it's a number, what range can that number be? It, mm-hmm. it, but it, it made it very, very verbose. And so even sending back like, you know, here's my to-do list with, you know, uh, go walk the dog and, and so on. And whether it's completed or not might be 10 times as much content actually being transferred back. Well, back in the day when SOAP started, like SOAP has, has been around for, for quite a while, um, it started in sometime in the late nineties. I want to say like 97, 98, maybe okay. where rest, rest kind of came into play like shortly after that. Cause people are like, surely we can do better than soap. Um, and, but soap is still around, like even Salesforce, uh, folks that, that are familiar with, with Salesforce, even Salesforce APIs were on soap for the longest time. Um, but, Interesting. but doing, okay. doing things over, over XML because it was so much information, so much content, what we didn't have back in the day was a way to compress that data before we transferred it to a server. Where mm-hmm. now browsers, if you ever look at the user agent string of like what identifies your browser, you'll see the letters GZ or GZIP. And that's basically saying like, hey, while we're talking, like while we got this communication channel open, by the way, I can compress this data. Can you also compress data when you send it back? And so it actually crunches that data down a little bit in transit. And so we're not sending these massive gluts of text anymore. They do get compressed. But XML compressed is still larger than compressed JSON because JSON just takes up less room overall. And so XML is still a very verbose way of explaining things it kind of over explains things but there are there are benefits to it as well like the data typing of this field can only be an integer from one to ten and this field has to be a boolean and it can only be true or false and if it's not Mm -hmm. set we're going to default it to false and things like like xml is is a very descriptive kind of markdown where json is just like here's a field it's set to false hope that's good with you um and and then it's up to the server to actually validate that what the user sent over actually validates properly of like wait you sent me a one it's supposed to be a boolean am i supposed to interpret that as a true like a one or a zero or did you Mm -hmm. accidentally send me an integer and so there there ends up being a lot more confusion about actually sending the right kinds of data over json there are binary versions of of uh, json called bson it's a binary structure of, of that. Um, and then there are other uh, mechanisms that can use like binary payloads of, of data in different kinds of APIs that actually maintain that data type. Um, but SOAP back in the day was just XML and it was very, very verbose. And so a lot of people just once once REST kind of came out, they're like, okay, we don't need to use SOAP anymore. And so SOAP quickly fell off. By 2005, like very few APIs were SOAP anymore. 
And then it still took like another decade for most of the other SOAP APIs to go away, but they're still out there um, and they still use XML. So, hmm. but it was, it, but SOAP was one of the first ways of actually interacting over the internet because the internet was still relatively new back then. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the, the internet really only came around like 93, 94, as far as like a public internet. Um, cause that's kind of when HTML started being invented was around 93, mm -hmm. 94. And then, you know, soap kind of came in to play around like, Hey, can we just get the computers to talk where it's not, everything has to happen through a browser. And so that's where soap kind of came to be. And then soap, Interesting. you know, got, got kind of, uh, overtaken by rest. Rest is now still very, very dominant. Um, but we're starting to see like web hooks and web sockets kind of like catch up a little bit, but not nearly as much. Um, and then we're seeing other kinds of APIs that are, you know, like gRPC and so on that are more performant. They're faster oh, at doing yes. their things. But that's a whole that's, other, that's, that's yeah, where you're getting into that. more, that's more getting into like performance tuning of like, I need the fastest possible way of like sending this data. So. Yeah, I, I wrote it down. That is something that I'm, uh, I'm ready. So, oh, I, I just double wrote it, whatever. But gRPC and like finding out more about that and like uh, event streaming and those things specifically would be interesting to learn about um, more. I think those are also more of my own curiosity because companies I've worked for use those terms a lot and I never understood them. That yeah. has driven a lot of my curiosity. Yeah, knowing how to interact with webhooks is actually a really cool part of being in programming these days because it, it does get into that event-driven architecture and the event-driven kind of internet of, hey, a thing happened. I'm going to let you know where you don't have to call me and find out if those cookies are done. I'm just yeah. going to let you know when the cookies are finished baking. Um, and so it, it allows for a lot more flexibility and power around like, uh, you know, when things actually happen, you get notified instead of having to go request, you know, whether something is finished or not. Um, so it just, it, it allows for a lot more kind of cool things to happen on the internet. Um, Yay! but like we said, you know, there, there are disadvantages too of like holding those connections open. And that means maybe mm -hmm. other people can't connect to that server. So now as the, as the service as Facebook or Twitter, now I need even more servers, which uses more electricity and more resources from the planet. And, you know, whatever. there's a lot that's, that that's goes a whole other it. soapbox. That's a whole other soapbox we can get into. Um, uh, but yeah, there's, there is a, there's a ton that goes into it that a lot of people don't really understand like how the internet actually works and how these things communicate. But mm -hmm. the starting point is like the internet kind of runs on APIs and knowing yep. how these things actually work is, is good. And I think from here we could start to go down a lower level and start getting into like, how are these things actually transmitting over the wires and like, how does that actually route around the internet? What if my ISP goes down or what if whatever it connects to goes down? Is there still a way that I can get that data if something breaks that, on the internet, yeah. you know? That's a big thing that I'm definitely looking forward to as well. So y'all, I just uh, gave Ian a shout out on the channel. Go make sure you follow his Twitch as well. And thank you, Ron, for the follow. I appreciate it. We definitely have gone through a lot. I'm kind of like, I'm totally wrapping things up. Um, sometimes I'm a little awkward about it. And I say that because I'm starting to get mushy brain where I'm like, you're saying things and I'm curious, but they're not computing as well. And sure. this is what I like to call like mushy brain, or I'm just like hit my saturation, whatever you want to call it. Uh, everyone go bug Ian to be back on the show because there is a lot we have. Oh, left you don't, to learn. you don't have and to bug me to come on this show. Yay. And then also make sure to go hit them up on Twitter and LinkedIn, especially for anyone looking for work. Like I honestly, especially in the tech field, Ian is so good at resumes and helping with job searches and teaching about all of this. And you can ask really interesting questions or when it doesn't click, he's very kind about it. I say that as coming from someone that did do that. So, and thank you again. Ian, anything you want to say before we I go raid them to somebody? Uh, Oviedo no, is saying links. Links. links uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, drop, I'll drop some links. Um, so I, I tend to use Ian Douglas 736 on all the platforms. Um, so like Twitter, Twitch, Kick, 
Instagram, Linktree. I use the same username on all Everything. those. Everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Except my YouTube channel. My YouTube channel is just Ian Douglas. Um, and I've, I've got a lot of like free videos. Um, you can go to iandouglas.llc as a website and it'll kind of branch you off on all the different things that I do. Uh, like the live stream and the 3D printing stuff and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's all through there. The tech interview dot guide, all my career advice. It's all free. Um, I've got newsletters you can sign up for on there, all that kind of stuff. So go check out iandouglas.llc um, yes. as a website. And you can, go, you can go find me on all the different platforms from there. Uh, but yeah, it's all free. So there's no paywalls. Um, the only thing that you would ever need to register for is like the newsletters. If you want to get tech newsletters about like, how to get ready for interviews and, and why we ask the kinds of questions that we do in interviews. I kind of approach it from a hiring manager's mind. Uh, but yeah, I'll be streaming in about uh, five hours. I'm going to do some, uh, some live coding tonight uh, using APIs. We're going to be building some chatbot stuff. So uh, feel free to, uh, to drop by the live stream if you want to hang out and, and nerd out some more. If you've got questions about other stuff, uh, I love taking questions on the chat. So. Yes. And definitely, again, y'all follow both of us. I go through mostly like new tech as I'm learning and developing. I bring everyone with me. It's not always with a guest, even though sometimes I like it more with guests because then it's like they are, you know, they can help coach me through it where when I'm streaming by myself, I get stuck and then I get really frustrated. But luckily, there's been some amazing people in the crowd when I've been learning Postgres. So Thank you, everyone. And let's go raid Chris. See, um, Griffin, really dope human. Always, uh, I believe he might be working on something new. It always takes a few minutes for the raid to go through. So thank you again, everyone. And this video will be posted later this week on YouTube and will be shared out too. Bye. See ya.